turn in your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 3 for our first lesson. We, this is a two-hour class, and we would take like a 10 or 15-minute break halfway through it normally, but because this class is a little different in terms of how we started, I'm not sure if we take a break and when we do. I think we will, but uh, when exactly, I'm not sure. We will end at 8. Uh, also, um, I encourage you uh, to turn off your cell phone. Okay. <clears throat> I encourage you to uh, read this book and glean from it. It is called uh, Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. You can get it off of uh, the internet, Amazon or, or eBay, and uh, I got this copy. I've had a few of them, and they've disappeared and been distributed different places, but I just got another copy, and I don't think it was very expensive. I don't really remember, but it, you can get one of these. This is a, a thorough overview of missions from a... A uh, biblical point of view, which is what we're starting in tonight, a philosophical, apologetic, biblical view of missions, thus the question that we asked at the beginning, a historical perspective, uh, and then a cultural perspective. So all of these articles are uh, they're very good. Not every, every one of, some of them are exceptional. And, and so I recommend that. Uh, I'd like you to see in this portion in Genesis 3 a very fundamental element of our faith. At the very beginning, when God planted a garden and he put Adam and Eve in the garden, he teaches us a lesson, a lesson that we we, we wonder even today if we really understand what God's intentions are for people. What has he intended for us being made in his image? The temptation, we'll draw a little sketch here, was that there was a tree in the garden and it was a tree of knowledge and we read here that it was good to look at. And this is in chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes. So we have the food element, which surfaces in the Bible quite often. There is food in our physical body relating to that, and then it was pleasant to the eyes. It was something that she could see and also enjoy. There was another element in the tree that appealed to her, and it was that it would make her wise. She would gain wisdom. The serpent said, that if you eat of this tree, you will be wise. This whole temptation really appeals to her experience. Not to faith, but to her experience. If she you know, was look, well, she looked at the tree, she uh, saw that it was good for food. She also was stimulated by what it looked like, and it would also make her a certain way. It would make her wise. And so this is a, a, a picture and a profile uh, of human life that is uh, fundamentally the issue in missions, that people live in cultures, people live 
lives today in cultures and they determine their lives based on experience. What they see, what they feel, what they think, what will meet their needs. They say, you know, uh, in Hinduism, in Islam, in Buddhism, communism, capitalism, Catholicism, in all isms, in Christianity and outside of Christianity, people determine what is true, what is real, what is important to them based on this simple exercise of what I experience. If this is my experience, if this is what I am feeling and it's what I am thinking, then I am interpreting for myself in this world what I want, what I need, and what is true and what is useful. But this, uh, this picture of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the first temptation of man is uh, constantly happening in life today in people's lives. They will say, I, am, I believe the way I believe because I was brought up this way, because this is what I have experienced, because this, in my opinion, there's a lot of words that can go in here, my opinion, my will, my desire, my people, my culture, my mother, my father, my country, my history, my personal preference. And experience becomes the very foundation for people's lives. There's a word for this in philosophy, and we can say that it is, um, we can say like this, there are people and then there is there is truth from their perspective, and this is relativism. And this isn't going to be difficult. If, you, if I lose you, it will become clear to eventually, and it is very simple, actually. Um, what is true for you? I am a Muslim, and my fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers and great-grandfathers We've been Muslims all through our family. Okay, what's the truth? Islam is true for me, for us, for our family. And it raises a question, a deeper question, and let's ask it this way. If you were born in India, what religion would you follow? You would be a Hindu normally, a billion people, 950 million Hindus. If you were born in Saudi Arabia, what religion would you have? Muslim. If you were born in Poland, what religion would you have? Catholic. And, if, and I ask sometimes when I'm soul winning in the city of Baltimore, I say, if you were born in India, what religion? If you were born in Poland, what religion would you have? What religion do you have now? And the man said, I'm a Catholic because that's what my family was. And I said, does that mean that if you were born in India, you would be a Hindu? And he said, yes, I guess it would. And then the question is, are you believing in what you're believing because of the culture that you've been brought into? Or are you believing because of something bigger and greater? And the answer, or in distinction to relativism, is what is called absolute truth. It is true regardless of your experience. It is true regardless of your culture. It is re true regardless of what you see. Remember the woman saw the tree and it was pleasant for her. But what if you saw a tree that was not pleasant? What if you saw a tree and there was no, tr no food on it? And what if you saw a tree and it would not make you wise? 
And there is such a tree. It's the tree that Jesus died on. On this tree, it was not pleasant. There was no food there, and there was no wisdom there. There was pain. There was foolishness, and there was weakness. Why did God give to us this tree? Because he wants to teach us that you cannot base your life on what you experience. You have to base it on that which is higher than your senses, your human reason, and your personal preferences. You need to base your life on that which is from him, and this must be revealed Revealed truth, not experienced, but revealed. There's a difference in the words. Are you with me? Oh, you're awesome. Praise the Lord. Revealed and experienced. <clears throat> the reason we're saying this is because Look at us and the paper that you just read and the paper that you just wrote. That on that paper you have to deal with a serious question. That if we are missionaries and we will be involved in people's lives and actually be disturbing their lives. Not out of malice, but we have been sent into the world not with a a cultural religion. We are not exporting American Christianity to Burma. We're not interested in going to Azerbaijan and getting a young person in trouble with their parents because now they become a Christian. We're not interested in troubling people out of malice, but we are saying that there is a definite distinction in life everywhere and it is when God reveals this is truth in the absolute sense, and it is different from when a man experiences and he bases life on his sight. It was pleasant to her eyes on food, the practical elements of life, and the third one on making him smart. Put here smart or wise in the sense of, of knowledge, benefit, being clever, being skillful. How, who wouldn't like to be the wise of the world being very clever, very educated, very talented, and very skillful, and live this life and be very successful. I mean, this is very natural. But we are those that are saying, no, wait a minute. There has to be something, and this is the argument that I think makes a lot of sense, and it is this one. And I ask people on the street this, if I have a hundred people and I ask them all what they believe, if I ask a hundred people what do you believe, how many different answers will I get? Huh? A hundred? Maybe I would get, if I asked people what they believe, I could get 30 different answers, 40 different, maybe 13 if there's a more homogenous group of people, I could get a wide variety of 70 different answers. And then I join the group, and now I am the 101st person. How do I, how can I say to everybody else that I know the truth? How can I say to everybody else that I, I know what is true, what is real? How can I say that this is true, this is real, this is the way. And that also, not only that, but I say it is the only way. 
How can I say that? And what is the answer to that? What? It's not me. Thank you. What we're saying is that, that for everybody there is one absolute truth that is not coming from our opinion. It is coming from Jesus Christ, who is a different tree. The beginning of your Bible, when she ate of that tree, she sinned. And in sinning, she died. He and man died, Eve and Adam. And when they were departed from God, now they have their life based on their experience. And by experience, I mean their senses, as in sensuality. Sensuality not in the sexual meaning, but sensuality in the sense of my five senses, what I see, what I hear, more senses than that. Psychologists say that man has 28 senses I've read. He has many different ways of perceiving the world around him. He has intuition, um, he has his emotional senses, he has a reason, reason, he has social skills, and he is trying to know what is true. But we understand that nobody knows this real, this absolute truth except Christ. He is the one that fills the house that we spoke about on Wednesday night. He is the one that knows all things from the end to the beginning. So when I, talk, when I ask on the street, we had 100 people and everybody has a different idea, and I also. But I'd like to say to you that there is one that was raised from the dead, that is the evidence of the reality of ab absolute truth that is not based on man as we know man, but he was another man. He was the incarnation of God. He was the Christ. He was 100% God and 100% man simultaneously. He was a unique person. He was the last Adam. He was another one. And Jesus said in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, turn there with me, please. Isaiah 11, and we could start at verse 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And do you understand what that means? That there is a root system that is in the ground that is invisible, and that from the time of the last king in Israel with the, the removal of the Babylonian, the Babylonian captivity. There's a long span of time and there is no king in Israel. And the kings are underground in the sense that biologically only really God knows the seed of David and the Jews were very intent on studying who, who is of what, what lineage. And this stem, this root underground, the seed of David, is important because hundreds of years earlier, God promised to David that from your seed would be a king, and he would, his kingdom would reign forever. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 15. And then Jesus surfaces by Mary, who was of the seed of David, and Joseph also was of the seed of David, though he was not biologically the father, 
but he was legally the father of Christ. But he was not the father in that sense biologically, but he was the seed of David. Both lines, Mary and Joseph, so this is verse 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem, the underlying root system of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And we have seen that happen in the woods or in your backyard. You've seen a shoot come out of an underground root system that was invisible to the eyes. So Jesus comes out of the seed of David. Verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. This is the part I want you to see. He is not judging by what he sees, neither reproving after the hearing of his ears, not by the gossip and the opinions of men. He is not here, he is not reproving based on what he's hearing, nor is he judging by what he is seeing. But he is in communion with God. So, did you see that? You follow that? Okay, turn to John 14 with me, please. We'll repeat it. <clears throat> Missions. Amazing. Exciting. The greatest enterprise happening in the world today. No question, bar none. I mean, this is amazing. Missions. It's incredible that you and I are thinking about it, that we talk about it, that we pray about it. I had first exposure to it when I came to Bible College in 1972. Pastor Stevens, with a small group of us, he was preaching about missions and the need for it, and that he said, when we're going to send teams into different parts of the world, not just individual missionaries, but teams. And, uh, and I was excited to hear about it, but I didn't really think that I would be part of that. But within uh, three, two years later, um, we, we put together a team that would, after three years of Bible college, we would go to Finland as missionaries. And, uh, and we did. And it's, kind of, it's always been a big question, not only to the Finns, but also to us. Why would we go to Finland? It's uh, the size of California and the population of Rhode Island. If you scattered every, all the fins around the country, it would be one person in 27 square miles. There are more moose in Finland and areas of Finland than there are people. And it, the climate was cold and dark in the winter, and, uh, but the people were actually very awesome, very serious and, and willing and desiring, and the people that we met with a calling in their lives for God. But the Lutheran Church in the country, which is the state religion in the country, which at that time was uh, very high, there were about 87% of the population belonged to the church officially. But at the same time, the churches are empty. I believe it was five people in 100 would go to church in Finland, and most of them were older people. The churches were, you know, big, well-built, well-maintained properties with the services available, but hardly anybody attending. And what we found, and people would ask us, why would you come to Finland? Why aren't you in Africa? Why aren't you in Asia? Why aren't you somewhere where they are not Christians? Why aren't you in a Muslim country? And our answer was, was like, just we didn't really know except that our church sent us 
and that the Bible says to preach the gospel to every creature. And so you're a creature. <laughs> so here we are. In, in fact, what happened was that we found a treasure. We found that if we could teach the Bible and share the word of God with people and the Holy Spirit was moving there, that he was speaking to the hearts of people there. And then after two years, we started our own Bible college. We trained the Finns as we trained, and then we did mission work in Denmark, Iceland, Poland, Russia. Um, in, uh, we sent some people to England for a period of time, um, Norway, Sweden, and um, we did mission work one summer. We had a number of Finns go, I think, uh, I don't know how many countries, and then behind the Iron Curtain. And again, that, that was also an, a very uh, interesting thing to see happen. Uh, that we could go in the communist world and people would be listening and interested to hear about Jesus Christ, the preaching of the gospel. But I want to ask tonight as we think about this, what rights, rights do I have? What basis do I have in going somewhere? The world is like this in very general terms. Half of it, there's the quarters. One quarter is nominal Christian in population. A quarter of the world's population, as in Europe, North America, you could say it is post-Christian for sure. At the same time, there is the presence of churches like ours and the preaching of Christ somewhere in a quarter of the world's population. And this is in contact geographically with another quarter. And we could say that there are um, people, as in our country, Arabs that are studying at Loyola, or Notre Dame, or at the University of Maryland, and we can get in the car and go five miles and meet Arab people or Iranian people and share the message because they live amongst us. And this is about a quarter of the world's population that is not Christian. I mean, a quarter of the world's population, in this case, this quarter is not Christian, but it is in close proximity to Christians we are able to minister the message to people from all different parts of the world, the same in, Euro in Europe. But there, another half of the world, we need to travel and go there, to go, to travel, to leave our culture, to leave our home, to leave our country, and to get on a plane and to go over there and to minister where people have not, they do not have contact with Christianity, with the message. They don't have contact with a Christian. They maybe have never met one. They don't have contact. They don't have access, though we have the Internet nowadays. And this is, study is at least 20 years old. So I'm sure it has changed in some measure, but it still is important for us to ask the question and to think about it, and that is, is what we believing, is it for all the peoples in the world? Is it the answer? Is it the message that is from God? Is it important that they would hear? Now, I know that I'm speaking to a lot of people here that you are believers, you know that, you believe it. There's not a doubt in your mind about it. But it doesn't matter. We need to revisit it and rethink it and ask the question in our own hearts again and again. Is it really true that Christ is the only answer, the only revelation given to man the only Savior, the only atonement, the only way sin can be removed. Is he, is he the only solution? Is he the only answer 
the only way to God in this absolute sense. And we, was, we, we say yes, and the reason we say it is not because we have a personal preference for it, but because absolute truth is the basis of our message. And it's not based on experience, it's based on revelation. You may call that ex experience if you would like to, that's fine. I love experience, by the way. I'm a Christian that believes in experiencing God. I'm a Christian that believes in being filled with the Spirit in a way that it affects you, that of course it would affect you if this is God. I'm a Christian that believes that God visits the believer and the congregation and that this is experience. But I want you to get beyond this idea that, that my religion is based on my, my, my history, my culture, my family, and so on, but it has to be based on what God has said. Not what I am seeing, what is pleasant to my eyes, the food from the tree, this will make me wise. That is a formula for disaster. There must be another way of apprehending and getting a hold of truth, and it is by faith in another tree and faith in Christ, and I just say that he died on a tree. And the way we relate to that tree is by faith in him. And the Holy Spirit then reveals to us, and he gives to us that food that is deeply satisfying, that wisdom that is incredibly unique, and that pleasant nature a peace and satisfaction that can only come from God himself. For in the Garden of Eden, if they had obeyed God and not eaten of that tree, life would have been very much different for the, for the human race. We would know him. We would have a constant understanding and revelation of him. We would have that deep peace. We would not die. We would be changed from glory to glory. We would not have died, we would not have sinned, we would not have died and suffered as the human race has, as we have uh, in, in our history. What an what a amazing thing that is. Okay? All right, so there's an introduction. I mean, there's some provoking things. Take seven minutes, go in Jesus' name, and come back here in seven minutes.